Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, and let's get right back into where we left off in the book of Romans, and I'm not even going to take time in this half hour for any announcements whatsoever, because time is of the essence, and uh, we want to get as much covered as we can. I'm going to start in Romans chapter 3 in this half hour. Romans chapter 3, and we're still dealing with the word salvation coming out of Romans 1.16. So when we're through with the word salvation, we're going to go back and pick up in Romans 1.18. I don't know when that'll be. But uh, I've put a few of the th meanings of salvation on the board. I've put four. And I think I've probably got 11 or 12 or 13 on my mind that I want to bring out, if not in this program, in succeeding ones. But the imputed righteousness of God is involved in the plan of salvation. In other words, the moment we believe, God, by an act of imputation, covered us or gave to our account his righteousness. None of ours. It's all of his. And we pick this up in Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> and let's start at verse 19. Romans 3 starting at verse 19. And he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now who was under the law? The Jew, Israel, Judaism, temple worship. To those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, become guilty. Now, how far does the law reach out to? Everybody. Everybody. It was given to the Jew under it. He practiced it. It was his religion. It was his approach to God. But the law, as we understand the law, primarily the moral law, the Ten Commandments, didn't stop with the Jew. It reached out to every last human being not to save, because it couldn't save a Jew either, but to condemn. See, and this is where people have totally misconstrued the role of the law. It was never intended to save a Jew. All it was intended to do was show him his guilt. See, that's all the law could do. My, I've, I've just almost screamed at my class people. The law was on cold tables of stone. Wasn't even anything you'd like to embrace and hold to your breast. And it just sat there in stark tables of stone. It could do nothing to help that person keep it. It could do nothing to keep somebody from stealing or committing adultery or anything else that it names. All it can do is condemn. Guilty. 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 See? But... It didn't stop with just the Jew. It convicts the Gentile just as thoroughly as it does the Jew. All right, read on. Therefore, verse 20, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by doing what the law commanded, by doing good, by refraining from breaking the law, by doing what the law commanded, that's the deeds of the law. And there should no flesh be justified in his sight. That's legalism, see? The law can't do anything to justify a person. For by the law is the knowledge not of salvation, not of a way to heaven. It's what? The knowledge of sin. All it can do is condemn. You're guilty. And then Jesus took the law even further. He took it to the place where nobody can wiggle out from under it. And he said, even if you think it, You've broken it. All right? Read on to verse 21. But now. You know, I'm always stressing that three-letter word, but it's the flip side. Oh, under the law, all it could do was condemn. There wasn't anything man could do to keep the law except by virtue of the ritual and the sacrifices get back in a good relationship with God. But the law itself couldn't do it. All it could do was condemn him. 
But now, see, we're under a whole different set of circumstances. Christ has died. He's paid the sin debt. He's been buried. He's been raised from the dead. He's ascended to the Father's right hand interceding for us. But now, the righteousness of God, see, not of the human individual, but the righteousness of God without the law. See that? That just puts legalism out in the cold. But righteousness without the law is manifested. You know I'm always defining that word. That's put in the spotlight. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's what? The Old Testament. I remember years ago a group of men approached me and uh, they wanted me to help them start a work up here in northeastern Oklahoma and the first thing they told me as we began visiting about some of the things they didn't want any Old Testament taught I just closed up whatever I had and I said then I'm going home because I've got nothing to teach if I can't use the Old Testament you've got to use the whole you use all the scriptures Old Testament and New because they all dovetail together but he says it so plainly here that even though the law has nothing to do now with our salvation, with the imputing of righteousness from God to us, yet everything that you and I enjoy in this age of grace rests on what took place back there in the Old Testament. Just like I said in the last program, you can't go into higher mathematics until you've learned the simple part. All right, then verse 22. Even the righteousness of God which is, or through the faith, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that. What again? See that? Oh, people don't like that. They, they, they want to add something in there. They want to say, but we've got to do this. We've got to do that. We've got to do something. No, you don't. You believe. Now, when I talk about believing, I'm talking about really believing. I'm not talking about a head knowledge. I'm not talking about, well, yeah, I guess it all happened. No, I'm talking about when you get to the place that you can rest on these things and you can say, I believe it with all my heart. I have no doubt. I may not understand it, but I believe it. And that's the only way God can look at it. All right, come back to the text. This righteousness, then, that comes by the faith or through the faith of Jesus Christ unto all... We're not going to segment these people and put some in a higher category than others. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And again, when Paul says no difference, what are you referring to? Jew and Gentile. The Jew with all his legalism, with all of his background. He's on the same set of circumstances that we Gentiles are. All right, what does it mean to have imputed righteousness. Let's go all the way back to the first man that experienced it. Genesis chapter 3. The man who plunged the whole human race under the curse, made every one of us a sinner by birth, was also the first one to experience the imputed righteousness that God alone could impute. Now remember that word imputed was a bookkeeping term in Paul's day and it was like putting it to the account. That's what it, the word means. When something is imputed it was put to the account. Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. Now, of course, that implies the sacrificial animal. He had to kill an animal to get their skins. And that, of course, satisfied the requirement of a blood sacrifice, which we know that he demanded, as we'll see later in chapter 4 with Adam, uh, Abel. All right, so he kills the sacrificial animals, uses their skins to provide their clothing to take place of those fig leaves that were nothing, that wasn't God's idea at all. That was a human endeavor. But he kills the animals, skins them evidently, and puts the clothing upon Adam and Eve, and then clothed them. Now, too many people just read that and they think 
they think it was the physical clothing of those skins that is implied. No, it isn't. We're dealing with a spiritual phenomena here. And it is a restoration now of Adam, Eve, Adam and Eve back into a relationship with their creator. And it had to be the blood-bought way. And so that's why he had to kill the animals. That's the only way God can receive lost person, is by the shedding of blood. That's another one of the absolutes. Hebrews, chapter what? Eight, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Never has been and never will be. You don't hear it much anymore, but uh, that doesn't take it away. So here, Adam and Eve now have an imputed righteousness that clothed them. Now you say, how do you get that? Well, we'll stay in the Old Testament and come on up to Isaiah. Isaiah 61, and it explains it so beautifully. That this is exactly what Adam and Eve experienced, even as Isaiah did. An imputed covering clothing of God's righteousness. Isaiah 61, drop down to verse 10. Isaiah 61, verse 10. Oh, this is beautiful. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he, God, hath clothed me with the garments of what? Salvation. This same word. Salvation has always meant the same thing. Even in our secular world, we'll still use the word salvation. I have someone, as I've used the illustration over and over, someone is about to go bankrupt. Boy, and they just can't dig themselves out of the hole. No way. But a rich uncle dies and leaves him a whole stash of money. What's the death of that uncle? Hey, it's the salvation of this old boy that's about to go broke. All of a sudden, he's made well. That's what salvation has always meant bringing somebody out of a destitute place. All right, Isaiah uses the same word. The garments of salvation. He hath, what's the next word? Covered me. See? What did Romans say? He has, got to go back and look at it. He has placed the righteousness of Christ unto all and upon all. See? Covers us. All right, back to Isaiah. For he hath covered me with the robe of what? Righteousness. His righteousness, not ours. You and I can't look at each other and, and see our own righteousness. We, it's impossible. But when God looks at us, he doesn't see my righteousness. He doesn't see yours. Whose righteousness does he see? His own. The imputed righteousness that he has provided. You see how that just leaves us out of the picture altogether? I mean, there's nothing we can do for our salvation but believe it. We just have to keep our hands off. All right? So he has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. You know, even the plainest of girls, she's always beautiful when? At her bride, at her wedding. Uh, we've been to a lot of weddings, and I've never yet seen a bride that wasn't beautiful. And I think that's why the scripture uses that analogy. When God looks at us, he sees something beautiful. And in ourselves, we're anything but. But he doesn't see us. He sees himself. All right, so now then, back to Romans chapter 3. Look at it again. The same thing happened to Adam that happened to Isaiah. It has happened to us if we've believed. And that is that he has covered us with an imputed righteousness. His righteousness and none of our own. The scripture says our righteousness are what? Filthy rags. And you and I don't even want to think what a filthy rag was in the scriptural account. But whatever. That isn't what God sees. He sees his own righteousness. And upon all them that, and again we enter into that by faith, by believing now, we'll come to the second one I've got up here. After we've got imputed righteousness as part of our salvation, we are justified. Justified, and that's in verse 24. 